Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming and taking part in our Christmas Eve service. It is just a, a great time to come together and celebrate and worship Jesus together. And so I just want to extend a real warm welcome to all of you. So, so good to have you guys here with us. And I want to take a little bit of time tonight and talk about um, the light of Christmas. And uh, that's what we are here to do tonight, to, to celebrate Jesus, the, the light of the world. How many of you guys love to see the lights around Christmas time? Anybody here like to see the lights around Christmas time? How many people have their houses lit up with Christmas lights? All right, super. How many people have a Christmas tree with lights on it in their home? All right, a lot more hands going up there. How many people have Christmas trees with lights on them that have half of the lights out? Anyone here? All right. That can be pretty frustrating, can it? All right. Trying to find what light bulb is causing the rest of the string to be out, right? I know they've kind of come along in some advancement technology so that the whole string doesn't go out, but back in the day, you had one bulb that went out, it affected the whole bunch, didn't it, right? Pretty frustrating. It's like, forget this, just buy a whole new string. I'm not going to go through each bulb. It can be tiring. I had my house lights that started to, or, or stopped lighting in some areas, and, try, and, and I couldn't even replace the bulbs any longer. I had to just go out, and today, matter of fact, I'm out there in the rain, replacing whole strings so that the rest of the house is lit up. It's, it's crazy what we do over this time of year, but if you're like me, I'm sure you love to see the lights around Christmas time, right? Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. So great to see the lights around Christmas time. Now, can you imagine with me what this season would be like without lights? That would be pretty weird, wouldn't it? But really, this tradition of hanging lights at Christmas time and and around the season is a fairly new thing to see happen. Uh, of course, this wasn't the way that it always was, for sure. And we can thank uh, Mr. Thomas Edison for that, all right? I'm sure candles were used for centuries before that, but nobody had a, a Walmart to run to to go pick up a string of like 100 candles to hang in their home. So I think we can assume that it wasn't as lit up as it was or as we see here today. I mean, we got, we got LEDs or... Uh, laser lights shining on houses now to brighten it up. I mean, we got the full meal deal going on nowadays, right? When it comes to lights and lighting things up. But it wasn't always that case here. Now, we're going to take a little look back in history. Not as far back as, you know, the Middle Ages or even to Bethlehem in the manger. But we are going to get there. Don't worry about that. But I want to I look back to about 125 years with you here tonight. Imagine you're living in the late 1800s when darkness falls, your only source of light comes from fire, whether that be candles or lanterns or oil lamps. Night was dark. When night fell, it got very dark. Have you ever been out camping out in the, out in the wilderness and you know what it's like to be away from the, the, the light pollution and to just get out and to see the starry night sky without any kind of other lights around. It is breathtaking. But you see also how dark it can get. Now imagine back in this time, that was very normal. Even cities were pretty dark at night, despite the, the smell of oil lamps that would be lingering and, and a few candles flickering on into the night to bring some illumination. Things got Still pretty dark then. So you probably would have been surprised and curious back then, late 1800s, when you heard that Thomas Edison was giving the first public demonstration of the very first practical incandescent light bulb. He was doing that at his home and in his workshop in Menlo Park, New Jersey. If you were a, a well-to-do New Yorker, you would have boarded a Pennsylvania railroad train back on December 31st, 1879. And ridden those 20 miles or so to sleepy Menlo Park. Be dressed in your finest New York best, you know. You would have disembarked the train and walked past a dozen or so houses in that tiny town. Gazing open mouth up into the cold night sky. Because it wasn't the stars that you were marveling at. But the glowing artificial lights on lampposts that were lining the street all the way to Thomas Edison's home. And it glowed with an electrical radiance. And it would have been very and completely foreign to those people that were there taking that in that very first night. And it would have been something that had filled them with a sense of amazement and wonder, no doubt. Of course, that wasn't the first time light had come and changed the world. In fact, 
Light changed the world from the very beginning. Think about the very first words that God spoke back in Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then on in verse 3, it says that God said, first words, let there be light. Think about that. And there was light. It says that God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So from creation, the Bible leads us through humanity's progression from the light of God's perfection to the darkness of man's fall and his depravity and sin. And then through the generations and centuries of waiting for the dawn of the day when the Messiah, the promised one, would come and bring that light of restoration once again. Well, that day came, but not like anyone expected. 2,000 years ago, on what we call the very first Christmas night, came the incomparable, world-altering arrival of the true light of the world in Bethlehem. And it was a truly wondrous light that gave a, and made a sense of amazement and wonder. And this wonder Christmas can run even deeper as we grow older, as we realize the pain and the destruction and injustice of the darkness around us. We can experience more capacity for wonder and awe at the light that we have. Our hearts are ready to be pierced and illuminated in new ways by the dawning now of God's light. That's what happened for those who are part of Jesus' first arrival on earth, when that light shone into the darkness. Let's look at how his birth created different kinds and, and different levels of wonder in all who encountered Christ that night. First of all, we think of courageous Mary and, and Joseph, all right? Mary and Joseph were two people that witnessed and experienced this light firsthand, no doubt. On that first Christmas Eve, they were very young. They were tired. They were alone. They were probably afraid. Their lives had unexpectedly been turned upside down. And while they had been given miraculous messages, they had nine months to walk through that emotional darkness from being culturally stigmatized. Angels had told Mary and Joseph not to be afraid and that this was what God had planned. But can you imagine, explain to someone else that you'd received this message from an angel? Here's what the message said, or the angel said in Matthew 1, verse 20 to 21. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph, do not be afraid, but I'm sure, like any new dad, his knees were knocking. He's thinking, are you kidding me? Do not be afraid? Who's going to believe this, first of all? Who's going to accept this? Who's going to allow me to continue on and not even be married to Mary? But Mary and Joseph chose courage. They chose to believe the voice of God even when others around them perhaps didn't or couldn't or wouldn't. And they chose to follow God despite the rejection and the disgrace of Mary being pregnant outside of marriage. Then came the long, hard journey to Bethlehem. The couple had to be wondering, no doubt, what in the world God was doing. Lord, we could have... Could have just done this a little bit easier, you know. I mean, the donkey ride to, to Bethlehem, being fully pregnant, this is not an ideal situation, no doubt. God, maybe, you know, let's rethink this through or something like that. But the birth of Jesus came, and it added that new and deep sense of wonder. If you're a parent, you know the sense of wonder that comes with the arrival of a new life, especially the, the arrival of your firstborn. It had to be part of what they felt, but then unexpected worshipers from unexpected places began showing up. They were sent by angels, and that awe and reverence and wonder had to deepen. Luke said in, in Luke 2 verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You see, despite the crazy circumstances and the difficulties to get there, no doubt, Mary recognized the wonder of this moment, and she treasured it. She pondered in her heart and mind this mixture of both amazement and belief and, and questions and faith and an overwhelming sense of being part of a universally larger plan orchestrated all by God. 
Think about the wonder and amazement she would have been experiencing that night as she pondered all these things in her heart. And as Mary and Joseph let Christ's light shine into their hearts and lives, they surely must have found new courage to trust and to step forward no matter how uncertain the way ahead might seem. Well, we move from the courage of Mary and Joseph to the surprised shepherds, all right? The shepherds are the, the meanwhile in another part of Judea part of the story, right? They're off tending their, their flocks in the fields nearby. These guys were definitely in the dark. I mean, literally, they're out in the fields and it's nighttime. They were somewhere out in the fields. It's, it's in the wilderness at night watching over their sheep. There was, this is nothing new to them. They were used to being out in the dark. They were used to being out with their flocks at night. They probably had a small campfire for lighter warmth. Moving around in the pitch darkness was completely normal for guys like this. And they must have been up just marveling at the, the night sky, the moon, the stars. But nothing would have prepared them for a sky full of angels. Can you imagine their surprise when an angel, who knows, maybe glowing. I don't know how big this would have been, but this would have probably taken their breath away to some degree. And this angel appears and tells them he had good news. And then a whole crowd of angels lit up and began praising God, perhaps in song. And the shepherds were awestruck. The Bible says that they were greatly afraid. I don't know about you, but I, I probably would have been in that category. I'd seen a whole realm of angels in the night sky speaking. I probably would have been greatly afraid too. This is quite something to behold. But they were completely taken by surprise by this absolutely unexpected event. But... The shepherds didn't sit around talking about how crazy their angelic encounter was. They didn't shrug it off because they couldn't understand it. Instead, what did they do? They immediately got up and went to see for themselves. It tells us in Luke 2.15, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Of course, the shepherds weren't supposed to go anywhere that night. They are supposed to stay in the dark field with their flock, watching their sheep. That was their job, right? They, they were supposed to be responsible. But after their surprise at the light of the angels and the announcement of the arrival of the light of the world, they were overwhelmed with wonder. Nothing else mattered. They were filled with this amazement and drawn to go and experience more. Well, we move from the surprised shepherds to look at the trusting magi. Later, we see the magi come onto the scene. They encountered the light of a star, and they followed it in the night sky. Now, these guys, the magi, the wise men, as we oftentimes refer to them as, they were educated and smart. They studied the skies. They knew the stars. They regularly watched the heavens filled with twinkling lights and studied their significance. They knew that this star that shone in the sky that season was different. And unlike the shepherds, these wise men, these magi, they were not surprised. The Bible even tells us that they knew the star marked the birth of the king of the Jews. It tells us in Matthew 2, verse 1 to 2, Now after Jesus was born at Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? How do they know this? Because we've seen a star, they say, in the east, and we have come to worship him. Where is this king? We know because we've been awaiting his arrival. We've been watching. We've been waiting. We've been expecting. And they follow the star. The Magi knew what the star meant. Even on a celestial canvas of almost infinite lights, this one stood out and it filled them with a sense of wonder. And they were so amazed that they were drawn into action and compelled to go and take a long, difficult journey to see and worship Jesus. They didn't just wait and go, hey, you know what, we'll make our way over there when we have some other business to take care of. Or we'll wait and read about it in the headlines in a few weeks. You know, they're like, no, we're going. And we don't care how far it is. They're way out from, east, from the east. They don't worry about how long, how hard this journey might be. They know the importance of it. They're filled with amazement and wonder, and they want to be a part of it. What's also important to notice is that along the way, the Magi came face to face with the darkness of evil. 
maybe they thought everyone would be celebrating the momentous arrival of the Messiah. But when they arrived in Jerusalem and inquired about this new king of the Jews, King Herod was there, and he wasn't happy. He was threatened by the news now of a new ruler that had come onto the scene, and he wanted to hold on to his power at all costs. When Herod encountered the light of Christ, his reaction was to try to snuff it out, to squelch it. I don't want that light to continue. I want my light to continue. This is Herod's response and reaction. He didn't experience wonder. Instead, Fear drove him to use lies and deception to try to destroy the Savior of the world. When he asked the wise men to return and tell him where they'd found the baby, it wasn't so that he could also go and worship Jesus. He intended to get rid of any ruler who threatened his own power. Now, it may have worked at first. The wise men went to find and worship Jesus, and it took an angelic warning about Herod to send them home by another route, to send them away. From Herod. But the Magi had to make a choice. Follow the light or give in to the fear of darkness. After all, what if Herod sent his soldiers looking for them? What if Herod had caught up to them, demanding to know why they were avoiding him? What if it costed them their lives? But they chose to go on and to listen to the angel and to avoid Herod. Maybe it was the wonder that drove their decision. But the Magi chose to trust the fullness in their spirits and the fulfillment, even in incredibly humble circumstances of the quest that they've been called to. They understood that there was more than met the eye in the arrival of this new king. They knew that what they encountered was indeed a fulfillment of the prophecy that they had been studying and waiting for. And they chose to side with the light of Jesus and to be filled again with that wonder. So Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the magi, these three different groups of people had three different experiences of darkness and light. Yet each of them allowed themselves to experience the wonder that comes from an encounter with the light. But what about you? Where do you find yourself this Christmas Eve? Are you in a place of emotional darkness, doubting, overwhelmed, maybe feeling burned out? Wherever you find yourselves this Christmas Eve, I invite you to experience the wonder anew of the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because the same God who spoke light into existence at creation has sent his son into this world to be the light of the world. To dispel whatever darkness has filled your life. Whatever despair has come into your life. God sent his son to be a savior for you and to shine his light. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, the darkness of our world, and we see a lot of it, especially in the news, especially in the different things going on in our worlds, both personally and globally, we see and are experiencing a lot of darkness. And yet, we have to understand that that darkness does not, cannot, will not prevent Jesus from coming and shining his light in those situations. In fact, it's because of the darkness that Jesus came. Isn't that good news? It's because of the darkness that Jesus came into this world. It's the very reason we feel wonder when his light arrives amidst the darkness. Jesus was born to save a broken world. He was born to save broken people like me, like you. People that needed saving, and we all did. Jesus came for a world like that, for a people like that. He came as the light to guide us into right relationship with God, our creator. You know, later in Jesus' life, as he was teaching, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. That's a promise for each of us. And tonight, I invite you to experience the wonder of his birth and allow him to be the light of your life this Christmas Eve. For his light to come in and dispel 
every bit of darkness and despair and discouragement, to let his life and his light fill you with that sense of amazement and wonder. Because he came to this world to shine your light. He came in this world to be a savior, to forgive you of your sin. We all needed that forgiveness, every single one of us. For the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But even in that position, it tells us that, that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He came not just as a little baby boy in the manger, but he came to live among us, to live like us, to identify with us, so that he could be that final and perfect sacrifice. He died on a cross, and he died in our place, so that he could take the judgment of God, so that he could take the, the, the very... Judgment of God that we ourselves deserve for our sin. And though the world at that moment thought, that's it, we're extinguishing the light. He rose again three days later with great power and might. The light still continues to shine because he's alive today. And he wants to shine in your life. He wants you to experience the life that he has, that he came to bring, that he wants to give you here tonight. I pray that you have experienced that or that tonight will be a turning point where you will begin to experience that life, that forgiveness of sin, allow his light to shine in your life. Can I pray here with you and for you here tonight? Worship team, you guys can come back up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your life. We thank you for the work you've done for us in saving us. Thank you that you came to identify with us, to live among us, to do a work for us that we couldn't do. And in so doing, that light shone brightly. You rose again to signify that we can have life in you. Life, not just now, but life eternally. And yet it's our own sin, it's our own way that keeps us from that. But I pray that tonight, Lord, people here would make that decision to give their lives to you, to surrender themselves, to say, yeah, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come and shine your light on my life. Replace my life with your life, Jesus. May I experience life in you. And I pray that you would do that work here tonight for each and every person, for those that have not experienced that, for those that have not had that in their lives. Lord, come and make yourself known to them here right now. And we thank you for this incredible night that... We remember when you came to this world, when you left the glories of heaven, and you came into this world to shine your light in the darkness. And we thank you and praise you for that, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. If you're here tonight and you, maybe you've never heard this good news before. Maybe you've never heard the work that Jesus has come to do for you. And if you are here tonight and you don't know him as your savior, you don't know that you can have a relationship with God and experience not only life today, but life eternal. I want to encourage you to come and talk with me after we're done here tonight. We're going to sing a few more songs, and, and, um, but I just encourage you to come and talk with me after the service here. I would love to share more with you about these things.